Hello and welcome. I'm the Restless Kaiser. And I'm Alan. But together we are Modeling for Advantage. Well, Alan, you're back. Yes. You obviously enjoyed it so much when I we did. unboxed the last one of these. I did. We've done the Hannibal Barker's yes. uh, Carthaginian Army. This one is called Scipio Africanus' Roman Legions. And I like the apostrophe after the S, right. as Africanus. I do, however, have a problem with Scipio Africanus' Roman Legions. Right. Do you know what that might be, Alan? How pro are you? I don't, I don't know, but this is maybe after the... Well, partly the legions are probably not strictly Scipio Africanus. He's the general employed to fight. Okay. So that, that's the, the, they're, they're the Roman states legions. Mm -hmm. Um... But uh, it's because he's not called Scipio Africanus until he beats Carthage in Africa. Yes, because he gets called. <laughs> like, he gets that name for winning this war. Yes. <laughs> he doesn't have it while he's fighting it. Yeah. Yes. Makes sense. Uh, so just thinking, and he probably wasn't even employed. He was appointed, and he was expected to. Uh, anyway, he's consul. He was consul. I think he's consul. He's not. I don't think he's a praetor. Consul, I think he's consul. Then, the consular then, army that went. But then presumably he has to cover his own expenses. He just doesn't. Uh, yes. He's not yes. paid. He's very much. Uh, he's not paid, but he's about to win a war, and that's really lucrative. And it's very lucrative because he's going to have tens of thousands of slaves when he wins that war, off, yes. and they're worth lots of money, as, as well as any gold or the contents of the houses of Carthage. Yes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so this, again, there's so many items in here we're not going to read through. We're just going to pull the bits out for you and then we'll talk about them one at a time and use that as a vehicle through which to talk about right. uh, a little bit of Roman history. Uh, nice bit of bubble wrap on top. Bubble wrap, yes. Uh, it serves no purpose. That feels like the baggie that a rule book should have come in, which is further down. All right. Uh, now, these are in tan, sir. Oh, they're in tan. So we've got Roman sprues. Pull those out. We've got another painting, painting guide. Painting guide, a little bit damaged, but only a little. Some cracker dice, some decals. Oh. Romans, 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 Romans. Oh. Bases. There's our rule book. There's our unique miniature. And these are some other sprues. All right. Give us a minute, we'll sort these into the relevant piles and we'll be right back. Well, before we get onto the sprues, you know you've seen the bases, so you get a whole bunch of these. Uh, interestingly now, I mean, I'm not sure about the numbers, I'll just check two, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. So on all the previous ones, in the Pike and Shot and the Gettysburg and so forth, it was a smaller sprue for bases and there was one sprue per base. Right. It's now a much larger sprue which is probably better because you've got a higher proportion of the kind of basic stands to the commanders and the artillery bases than, than you had previously. So it's probably a bit more efficient, but it does mean if you're kind of passing them on to a mate, the, the proportions don't work the same anymore. As we have eight of those and I think 12 sprues in total otherwise. Should we start by talking about, oh, sorry, there was the rule book we talked about before. It looks to be the same rule book. It's just got um, um, uh, Punic War missions in it rather than various ones throughout the ancient period. The dice are very basic. The decal sheet, these are very different from the kind of lightning bolts of the Roman legions you may be familiar with. But probably, no, then that's for your Romans, I think. Right. Yep. The two halves of the shield. And this must be for your Roman allies. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure that I have got the patience to be putting decals on the shield of every single one of these guys. And there it says it says in a box, there are a thousand guys here. Yes. Uh, and there aren't a thousand decals. Uh, but you, maybe you just do it on the prominent ones in the front row. But there are a lot, though. Obviously, yes. You do. As, as the two stands, there are two stands. You, yeah. probably, you probably just do it on the front ones. And, uh... Well, we'll come to the two stands thing when we get to the Romans. Right. So we'll start with these allies then, with uh, which we talked about before. So what you've got on here, what does it call them? What does it say there? Uh... The infantry. Sorry, because 
Remember how we're saying that with the, with the other ones I, that we're counting as. I hate to say... Uh, Celtiberian warriors. Right. Just An having, Italian just having medium a look infantry. at these guys, oh, yeah. they would appear to be the same spur stands or sprue as provided for the Carthaginians. No, I'm sorry, I thought that I thought that was clear. Yes, it uh, is exactly. Yes. Yeah. These are representative of the client states of Rome. States of Rome. Some of them will fall yep. or rebel. Some of them will stay loyal, yes. and many of them will change their yes. loyalty over the ten years. Yes. So what we've got on here. Um, it's Italian medium infantry and Celt Iberian infantry, and I think so. Your Italian infantry is going to be these ones with the big hoplite type shields, yes. and your Celt Iberian ones are going to be the yeah. smaller two. Um, so the Second Punic War, this Iberia thing, the Second Punic War breaks out over an issue in Iberia. At the end of the First Punic War, Carthage has been lumbered with these massive reparations. Right. And to pay it off, some um, Republican, some Carthaginian magistrates, particularly Hannibal's father, Hamilcar, have gone to Spain to create a new empire because the Spanish mountains literally run with rivers of silver. That is, that is a fact. It is mined out many thousands of years ago. But it was mountains made of silver back then, and the Carthaginians have gone to get them. Rome and Carthage have agreed spheres of influence at the end of the First Punic War and that they won't interfere with one another. And something breaks out in the northeast of Spain with a Spanish client kingdom of Rome, which begins with an S, and I can't remember it at the moment. And so basically when Hannibal attacks there, then the Romans decide we're going to have a war now. But Hannibal's been trying to provoke a war. Um, so both Rome and Carthage have clients in, in, in Spain. And at different points, what happens in the war with Hannibal is the Romans end up realising that every time they fight Hannibal, they get smashed. And every time they fight any of the other Carthaginian commanders, they can win. So they have legions all over Europe fighting other Carthaginian commanders. So there is a lot of fighting that goes on in Spain in this war. It just isn't against Hannibal. It's against various people called Mago uh, and Hanno, uh, which seems to be, this seems to be a very small pool of Carthaginian names in the text. But I don't know whether that's just because the Romans didn't know them. Uh, but yeah, we've looked at these before. So these, they look a bit Samnite like to me. Um, with us, so I think that they'll be your um, Italian ones, and these are very much just hoplites, whereas your uh, Celt Iberian ones, these again reflective of that kind of mixture of Spanish Celt and German Iberian tribes. Like they're carrying javelins as well as spears, well. yeah, hoplites yeah. are just carrying. They're, they're more, they're more of a warband type, I think. Yes. But that's <clears throat> where you're going to get your cavalry from, and I think for this Roman army, this cavalry is very important because of how Rome recruits its own units. Yes. Yeah. And so again, we've got that, we've got that Celtiberian uh, lighter cavalry uh, and the medium cavalry, which are the ones with the bigger shields, I think. Yeah? Yeah. And some skirmishes on there and so forth, which make up... So there's more, there's eight of these, whereas there's four of those. But when we move to the Roman sprue... Thank you. You're going to see that it's a little bit different to oh. the other sprues. Yes. So if you remember what I said to you at the beginning about uh, Stallard's view, we wanted really dense troops. Yes. The Romans are three ranks on a base, not not right. two. And what, and they've done that by having this, see this, these ones here, this is the middle strip. Yeah. And it's just heads. It's just heads. You shoulders. plug the other two into it. So you actually only paint what effectively one figure for this block. You yes. paint the back of this one, the front of this one, and then just three sets of heads. Yes. And they are absolutely chock-a-block. Yes. I'm not sure. I'm going to need to get some in my hand painted up, whether they're too dense for my liking. Right. Yes. But they are incredibly dense, and it's nice to see that they're kind of experimenting with the medium yes. a little bit. 
Um, so you've also got the other two on here, you've got your light infantry and you've got your cavalry. So this Republican Roman army, yeah. this is the army, the Roman army that most people are familiar with, the legionnaire, where everybody in the legion is the legionnaire and he's an engineer soldier yeah. with a sword and a pylum and a big shield and this kind of strap armor this larger segmentality or chain mail was actually mo chain actually mail. more common um all of that is relatively late to the history of rome i can't remember exactly when marius comes around this chap called marius um and he is one of a long chain of very senior Roman politicians who kind of have a stab at being emperor. So Romans share their, their magistrates and they are always a minimum of two people do the job with equal weight. So there are two consuls, these are the senior magistrates of Rome um, and neither has authority over the other and you're only elected for one year. So it's a power-sharing oligarchy. Under the Republican system, you weren't supposed to be consul more than twice. Right. It was somebody else's turn. Marius does it like half a dozen times, maybe more. Even as a really old man, he's still going to be consul. A civil war breaks out, he's defeated. But one of the massive things that Marius does to the Roman army is he changes how it's gonna be recruited, paid, and structured. In the earlier Republican period, Roman armies are levied. And they're levied for one year from the landed classes, because you have to buy your own equipment. Now, most Roman peasants own some land. Yes. So there was plenty, there was plenty enough people to be recruiting from. But as Rome grows and wins wars, it starts filling up with slaves. And nobody is employing people if they don't have to. They'd sooner buy a slave to do it. Yes. And, and, the, and, so, and more and more land has been bought up by the, by the aristocracy, these oligarchs. So less and less people working the land. So what they're finding is they just can't recruit soldiers on the scale that they need to with this. Marius says, there's tens of thousands of unemployed Romans every year in Rome. Let's recruit them, let's pay them, and let's equip them. Yes. That army is not this army. That army is the one you recognize from all the movies. The pre-Marian Republican army is a levy, and it's quite structured and is made up of very different units. So do you know what these units are, Alan? I'm trying to remember. There's the print. Principale, who There's a principes? are the old, older individuals who are equipped like a hoplite. No. No. Oh, that's the triarii. The triarii. The triarii is the third rank. Right. And they are the older men. They're the veterans, the veterans. and they are spear, spear and hoplite. Hop they are hoplite. Hoplon. They are hoplites. Yes. Um, <clears throat> And their function in the battlefield is they're like the rallying point, the fallback position. Right. <clears throat> they can block cool. cavalry from outflanking. Yes, they, are. they are they are there. They're holders. They're standers. They're they're not attackers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But they're reliable troops because they're experienced and they tend to be older men. There are then two different wings of troops armed in the traditional Roman style with the big shield and the pylum and the gladius. Yes. Yeah. And then a Hastati and the Principe. Yes. The Hastati, I think, are the younger of the two, yeah. the younger and fitter, and will tend to be a lot less well armoured. Right. The whole system has been designed to fight three units deep, which is a real problem for war games. Right. War games offer usually offer very little benefit for any depth, mm -hmm. and if they do, it's having some depth, you get the bonus. Right. Yeah. So the idea of fighting three ranks deep, yes. uh, and not three ranks deep, but three units deep, is how they are. Mm. So the Hastati and the Prince of it are very similar. You'd struggle to put sort of a difference between them, I think, yes. as a war game. Uh, um, they would broadly speaking be the same, unless you had a, like a lot of granularity in your quality. 
Then there's your light infantry. The Velites. Which are the Velites or the Velite, um, which are on here. And these are the youngest uh, and and so forth. These are often sort of teenage types, yeah. like 17, 18, 19. Um, or just all the guys who are skinny or live or whatever. They will go to the Velite. They're the light infantry, the Roman Velite. Usually it's a buckler type shield, couple of javelins, but a wolf pelt. Right. Wolf pelt. Gotta go get your own wolf pelt. Right. Sure. Yeah. Those are all taken from the levee. And we know a lot about this because a chap called Polybius, who's a Greek, who was a, I think he's a slave, not a slave like working in a mine, a slave working in a, in a scriptorum for someone, and I can't remember who it is, um, but he writes a lot about this system. So we know how this draft worked in great detail because there's a fifth element and it's not the cavalry the weakest and most useless of all the men that turned up for the draft would go to the navy right right <laughs> that's that's where they went but they were basically sorted almost by a medical you know examiner would sift them into these groups you're doing that you're doing that so where that provides a little bit of an issue with this sprue you mentioned earlier yeah. is the ratios are not equal no ratios, no, ratios are not equal or they are equal, and so they should it, On this sprue, they are equal. You're going to get one base of Hastati, one base of Principe, and one base of Triarii. Um, but actually, there were half as many Triarii as there were Hastati and Principes. Right. And I can't remember with the Velite, I think they're also half as many. And it may well be, but it's difficult to tell because the Velite are skirmishers. There and they're on skirmishing bases, bases yeah. So it actually, there's only like four or five figures on here. Yes. Yeah. So there may be more bases, but... So, but what what you were doing with this, and this is one of the reasons why Rome can keep fighting... Sorry, there's another unit on here, which is the cavalry. Okay. And the Roman cavalry is tiny amount of legionary cavalry. And that is, again, because in this pre-Marian period, it is from a draft of citizens. The cavalry are from the merchant class. Right, yeah. They are the equites. So they are, you know, your... Elon Musk's and Alan Sugars of the world, but they, but they are, and their sons. Yes. Yeah. But it was that that social class is drafted into the equities. Yeah. So normally, in a in a legion which might be as many as five, about five thousand, a legion, only 200, 250, maybe three hundred cavalry, right. which is why the Romans tend to lean heavily on their allies for cavalry right yes um, because of how they recruit that as i say all changes with marius so what do you reckon to this idea of only having to paint one finger in three alan well <laughs> it's it seems like a good idea but i don't know how is say it works out in practice if you wanted to have a look at the box yeah there is an example of a unit made up yes there is yeah now i've, I've so, seen them in in their cabinet yeah they look they do look very dense they look very dense um but and so you may be getting a lot of figures on the table but you're not getting the the expanse of figures mm. um, the mass of figures but um it would save painting on the figures as you say we just don't get looked at yeah yeah, you're not painting when you're doing those like Napoleonics, and you've got them six ranks deep, yes. ranks four, three, four, and five. I mean, you, you yes. just can't see those guys. In this way, you don't have to paint them. Yes. Um, yeah. So I don't know how distinct it is between the Triaria and the, uh, not the Triaria, the Hastati and the Principe. I was just looking at that. There it seems to be. It'll be to the plumage. This plumage, because some have only got war, Some have got a, a side-on plume. And then some of them have got three feathers sticking up in a... Is it not just that there's three short feathers versus three long feathers? No, if you have a look side on to the ones on the right. Ah, yes, of course. Now I'm just trying to clutch this there. The, uh, 
I know the Triarii are different, the triari, yes, but they've they're, got they're spears the as well, they stand out. So no, it's distinguishing between the other two. And there may not be any big difference. Particularly, I mean, I think the thing that I would expect to look different is the amount of armour they're wearing. Right. But they're totally covered by their shields. They're covered by their shields. On oh, the, the back's on, different. On the back's the yes. figure. Yes. On the backs, you can uh, see the chainmail. Yes. You can see the chainmail on the backs of one... Whereas it's just a, um, a tunic. It's just a tunic and on the back to the other. They may have chainmail on their tops, but they they have a longer coat. I think they have. Um, oh, you see, like this, like uh, again, like Sam Knights and some of the Iberians. It's like an iron plate right. on the chest, right. held with leather straps, which is basically right. literally just protecting your vitals. Right. Um, almost like you might find a plique armor on a tank that carries with a metal plate across right. his chest. Yeah. Uh, does the job. Um, so, I think it's interesting. I like it. Much more monoculture than the the very polygot Carthaginian army yes. that we looked at. Um, so your force is going to have a lot of Romans in it. So the nature of the Punic Wars or the second Punic War, the war with Hannibal, is one of the reasons why the Republic starts to break down. And it, and it's, well, it's certainly my belief, but I think it's, I think it's fairly widely held, is what happens during the war with Hannibal is all of the kind of processes by which we elect officials and we renew licenses and we raise armies, they start to, they start to look very inadequate for the job. Yeah. And that Hannibal just keeps winning. Right. And so we raise another army and he beats it. Now, because they raise and each consul raises his own army, right. and there's a new consul every year, yes. Rome is very well equipped for total war. Right. Because you get one year to get your glory. Yes. And that's it. Here you go. Here's 10,000 guys. Yes. Go and get some, go and achieve something. Yes. Consular armies, I'm saying 10,000, consular armies are normally two legions, but sometimes bigger. So that would be about 10,000 Romans and about 10,000 allies right. yeah. in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, yeah, in a consular army. Yes. In this war with Hannibal, they get much, much bigger than that. You also need a lot more than two armies. Yes. But the consular system whereby they yes. share power, yes. what had happened at Cannae and at Trebia is the consuls are disagreed about how to fight the battle. And you start getting situations where one consul thinks we should fight, yes. another consul thinks we shouldn't fight because we're at a disadvantage, and one day the army marches one way, and another day, the next day the army marches the other way. Because they've agreed to split power, you're in charge on Monday, I'll do Tuesday, da -da. and you're like, are you serious? You're going to run a war like this? Well, the Romans actually did do that, um, sometimes they say, you take northern Italy, I'll take southern, and that works a bit better. But the system does have a built-in mechanism for dealing with this problem, and it's called a dictator. Right. This is where we get it. An officer will be, a magistrate will be elected as dictator for six months to solve a crisis. Right. But this guy is going to be elected. Nonetheless, yeah. there will still be the two consuls yes. because they're, they're in for a year. Dictator is elected for six months and he has to have a Batman with him yes. who's called his master of horse. The expectation is it's a military problem. Right. You elect a dictator for six months. He gathers all the armies together, goes and beats somebody, then hands over the, hands over the baton back to the consuls and says, OK, we won now. Yes. Let's go back to normal. Right. But with Hannibal, you end up having dictators for years. Right years and years and years and you end up having consuls being prorogued for years because they're keeping these armies in the field for so long yes. you remember I told you these armies were levied yep right so who's going to pay them well um, well firstly they've got to be fed they've got to be, be fed, fed. yeah uh, so there's, there's that cost automatically coming so I don't know Presume it will come from the taxes, and presume the taxes will fall. The taxes will fall during wartime, war when, especially when you're losing. Yes. Yeah. One of the big problems with Roman armies up until... So you have this first kind of crack appears over the... We are having to elect our officials to much more serious, what's supposed to be temporary positions, 
for long periods of time. But what we're also doing is we are investing army loyalty in their commanders, not right. in the state. Right. Because it is the commander's job to get the army paid on demobilization. Right. All right. right. But the state doesn't have to honor that. Right. So if you've been out campaigning for five years, your soldiers are owed lots of money. Right. The state isn't going to pay it. Right. Maybe you should take over the state. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, is kind of where it all right. all all goes on. Um, and I think again, the, the kind of loyalty to the commander. There's that aspect of it, which becomes much worse after the armies are not levies; they become right. like paid soldiers. But because um, at the end of the campaigns, they expect settlement. They expect land. Yeah. But even these guys do. Yes. These guys at this period, they're expecting land after a successful campaign because our wars are supposed to be offensive right. in nature mm -hmm. and we're supposed to win them. Right. Our state is set up to do that. Yes. So it's kind of all the holes in the system when it's when it's on the defensive, when it's not doing very well. And it, it can continue to raise new legions, but it can't continue, it can't find good commanders. Its system doesn't produce right. good commanders. It produces people who are desperate to win a war right. in a year. Right. Um, and when that's an existential war across a, a whole country, that's just not achievable. Conversely, though, Hannibal's problems are not that different. Mm -hmm. Hannibal can't pay his guys. Right. What ends up happening with the Carthaginian forces towards the end is the Carth Carthage stops reinforcing him. Right. He's expected to make the war pay for itself. Right. As long as he's winning, as he's, as he's he making money, but he's losing men. He down. constantly is needing an injection yes. of troops from the homeland, and he's not getting it. So the way that the Romans eventually win the Punic Wars is, broadly speaking, by ignoring Hannibal, fighting everybody else, dragging it out. And it's, it's Fabius, who has been elected dictator at several periods through this, they go off the idea and then they go back to it when they lose battles again. Yeah. The Fabian strategy is to ignore Hannibal, go wherever he is and fight wherever right. he is. And following this strategy through to his extremes, mm. Consul Scipio yeah. takes his army to Africa, All right. where Hannibal isn't. All right. Hannibal's in southern Italy. All right. In fact, for most of the latter part of the, of the Second Punic War is in southern Italy. Hannibal goes, lands in North Africa, makes a deal with the king of Numidia, and is about to attack Carthage. Hannibal is recalled for that battle. Right. Yeah. That battle is called Zama. I'm pretty sure Zama was in this book. Yeah. Um, it's a huge titanic battle. It does not go well for the Carthaginians. I forget why, but there is a reason. I think maybe they fumble their attack or something. I can't remember why. Are their elephants stampede? I, I'm just making stuff up now, but I know something goes wrong. Um, the Battle of Zama. But the Battle of Zama remains an interesting historical curiosity. Remember I said there are no Carthaginian records? Yes. The victors write the books, right? But in this case particularly, yes. As they made big efforts to... As they made big efforts to destroy all yes. of the records, yeah. the Carthaginian records. There is some scope for debate over whether the Battle of Zama ever happened. Right. Right. It's a very fitting end for Scipio Africanus, the right. hero of Rome, right. who goes to Carthage to have a titanic battle outside the gates of Carthage with Hannibal yes. to win the war. Yes. That's a very poetic finish, isn't it? It is. It is. Well, I think some historians think it's maybe too poetic a finish. All right. All right. Because Hannibal had spent 10 years somewhere else. Right. And the Carthaginian magistrates did try and recall Hannibal a few times. Right. And he didn't go back because Carthaginian, the Carthaginian state punished its failed commanders. Right. Not by fines, imprisonment, or relinquishing of command. Right. Do you know how they punished them? Probably by death. They crucified them. <laughs> Not just death. The Romans, the death Romans, the Romans the Romans are taking notes. <laughs> Romans are taking notes about crucifixion. Absolutely, the Carthaginians crucified their failed commanders. Right. So when they recalled uh, 
Hannibal, and he was like, nah, I'm not going back. <laughs> so the idea that he went back, to, uh, it's not a widely held view. Right. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about this, uh, Lindy Beige, who I'm sure many of you know is a big YouTuber, he's talked a little bit about right. this. It's interesting. I think that there's no archaeological record. Right. Which, which, if there'd been a Titanic wouldn't, battle, wouldn't there probably should be something. Yeah, probably not but there's, over the years. But there's kind, of, there's kind of issues. They're not saying that nothing yes, happened yes. in the defence of Carthage, but maybe nothing like what was described, hmm. because it's a very, very kind of poetic and heroic um, uh, finish. We looked at these. There are three Punic Wars. Right. The first, second, and the third. These armies, this Roman army is fine for all of them. Right. Because all of them are pre Marian. Um, the Third Punic War is a bit of a joke. Rome decides it's had enough of Carthage and just turns up and destroys it one year. Yeah. It's not a, a, a Titanic war, it is a one year pro consular adventure. Um, in the same year, they sacked Corinth as well, I think. Right. It's like we, got, we can do both of these things at once. <laughs> You know, it's because it's not that big a deal. First Punic War is very big, possibly bigger in the size of battles, but the Carthaginians just don't put up enough of a fight. They don't put enough into it, which is why the Second Punic War is the one that everyone remembers, because it's predominantly fought in Italy with these forces. And I think the Carthaginian force that we looked at would be okay for the first and third war, right. but it had a lot of these kind of Italian and so forth allies, which wouldn't be in yes. those. I suppose for the third, the third war that Carthage was reduced to just a North African colony, so there probably mm. wouldn't be that many Celts or Spaniards no. in there. Well, the, but they were mercenaries. Yes, yeah, they still had mercenary armies. They wouldn't have the money to hire them. Yes, possibly. I yes. It certainly was not on the scale. Yes. Yeah. Not on the scale. So you've looked at the two forces. Yes. You looked at Carthage. You looked yes. at the Romans. You fancy the Romans more? Oh, I don't know. The Carthaginians have got more colour, haven't they? They've got also got a lot more figures. Yes. Right. <laughs> They've got a lot more figures. Especially bearing in mind that for every course, three Romans, it. you only have to paint one. one. Yeah. That's novel. And you have to... The, I mean, the number of decals, I mean, it's still quite yeah, a lot of guys yes. to paint, though. Yes. I think it's a great set. This set is not cheap. There is another set which is even bigger than this, which I think, I think this is somewhere in the region of 150. The other one is more like 250. It is enormous. Um, but this, when you look at the kind of the footprint of those, un those units, there are a lot of figures here. Um, if you know that you want to fight the Punic Wars, they are big battles. This probably is the set. It's definitely a shame that it's the price that it is, but I can see why is because of the scale of it. Um, I'm looking forward to having a go at some of these. We can, we can re-remember those uh, golden days of us playing WRG 6th. Six, six, back yeah. in the mid 90s. Yes. By which time no one else was playing 6th. Yes. People were playing 7th and DBM yes. and so far. Yeah. We were on 6th. We were still playing 6th. We six. were on 6th. Uh, where we did uh, Rome versus Carthage. Yes. And we had, we, had, we had the Barian Legionnaires filling in for the Republican Legionnaires. We did, <laughs> because we didn't have them yes that's right all right i hope that was useful yes. for you thank you for watching right. goodbye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. If you're still here and you're looking for ways to support the channel, there's obviously a lot of ways down in the description, but a key way is to use our affiliate links to Whaling Games and others. You buy your models from them, it doesn't cost you a penny more, and we earn a little bit of commission. Thank you.